We are very pleased to have Sheila Davis, who is the executive director of the Silicon Valley Toxics Coalition, to talk about her work in shaping environmental policy in the high-tech industry and reminding us that while digital media and the net and the use of all these fabulous electronic tools provides us with access to worlds that heretofore unknown and continuing to grow, that there are also downsides to it. So, Sheila Davis. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to be here. I'm sorry I had to go to the green room before I... <laughs> <laughs> the invisible green room. <laughs> um, and this is uh, quite thrilling to be actually be on a webcast. I've never done that before. So I'm also trying not to just stare at the computer in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I do want to give uh, just kind of a brief history about um, Silicon Valley toxics in conjunction with... Um, Silicon Valley and what at that time was called the clean tech or clean technology and uh, then I'll talk a, a little bit about what the impact um, and how I got involved in, in, in this issue and in this sector and what the impacts of electronic waste and I, and I kind of want to loop back into some of the new clean tech that's happening now and what the impacts of that might be. Um, and so before I start I guess I want to ask you guys, um, I'm going to start back in 1982. So how many of you, I know not many of you are actually around in 1982, <laughs> but <laughs> I will ask, how many of you actually had a desktop computer in 1982? That's pretty good. Was that at your work? Yeah? Okay. How many had a desktop computer at your home? Uh, still a good number of, of people. I guess we are in Silicon Valley here. <laughs> and how many people have more than one? That was about a little less than half the room. How many people have more than one desktop computer or laptop or cell phone in your house now? <laughs> how many people have probably more than three? <laughs> so. I guess my, the point, of course, and I, I'm sure I, I'm, how many people have either a desktop or a laptop that doesn't work in your house <laughs> that you need to throw away? <laughs> so that's basically what we're going to hopefully kind of travel through here is in terms of an industry that's really over the last 25 years in our lifetime has really taken off and what the impacts of those in, that industry is. And it's very hopeful because there are environmental impacts. And one of the reasons that I am in it is because you could see, and I could see, the change that happens in it really mm -hmm. quickly. And we could tell just by how many people had a computer 25 years ago compared to how many people have numerous computers in the house, many of them not working. 20, you know. And so just kind of thinking about the, the change that's possible here. So um, one of the, the major reasons that SVTC started Silicon Valley Toxics over, 20, over 25 years ago was because of groundwater contamination in the valley. There was um, a cluster, of course, of the industry that were growing up here at the time. There was almost 1,000 companies that were actually located here. And um, most of them um, had some type of manufacturing activity, but there was no regulations for the most part. You're talking about the 60s and the 70s, there was absolutely no um, environmental regulations. And so what happened in 1982 is that the groundwater um, was contaminated with about 60,000 gallons of uh, trichloroethane um, from IBM and, and Fairchild's plant. And um, over the, and of course, people found that there was uh, birth defects and um, different type of health impacts like cancer and leukemia that was also possibly connected to that. And um, there was a lot of uh, response from the community, and that's how Silicon Valley Toxics got started. And you can see on the slide here that those are the 29, those are contamination spots in the valley still, and there's over 29 Superfund sites that are located. And I really want to emphasize here that there were no regulations at the time that the industry started. So even though they were following all the regulations, they didn't, there weren't any. And so they didn't, they buried the tanks underground because they thought that they were actually, um, avoiding flammability if they had them above ground, but they, they didn't even have any kind of technology to actually monitor whether or not they're leaking. And that's important to remember as we think about clean tech. 
um, 19 irons, sorry, 2007. So again, some of these are some of the chemicals. There's over a thousand different chemicals that go into electronics, and um, these are some of the chemicals that actually leaked. Well, and the way I got involved in um, the industry or in this sector was I was actually interested in green jobs, and that was this was about 10 years ago. I wanted to. Um, I was in an organization that was combining electronic, not electronic recycling, but recycling and job development. And so I thought that computers had um, a lot of valuable materials. There's two to three pounds of, or two to five pounds of copper. There's gold. There's silver. Um, there was a plastic housing that was pretty valuable, and we paid a lot of money for them. So why wouldn't they be valuable to recycle? And of course, there was at that time there was a lot of them. Um, and so. I went to, to the city of San Francisco and Oakland, and we did a, a pilot program with the curbside collection programs. And people put their electronic products out on the curb, and I rode on the garbage truck, you know, and we picked them up. And I um, worked with a youth conservation corps and a, a drug rehab group, again, to see if there's any economic benefit in actually recycling the material. And um, we were going to disassemble it, which you have to do in order to recycle. And we were going to, you know, recover the gold. We we're going to actually make a lot of money, right? Well, we got it into the warehouse, and we first of all could not take it apart. There were so many different types of glues and screws. I mean, we would have need gone to Home Depot and bought every screwdriver in order to find the correct one to get each one of the different type of models apart. And um, there, they weren't the. Components weren't module at all either, so you couldn't at all break them apart. So what the, the youth ended up doing was taking hammers and pounding them apart. And then they created what they called a floor tool, which is basically lifting them over the head and throwing them <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> and so it was, it, and of course that was not very um, safe, <laughs> and it was very, <clears throat> excuse me, demoralizing, because I really did at that time think I was going to make some money. I thought that the programs I was working with could actually benefit and that you know this was going to be like a, a green industry that we could actually move forward. And um, so after we, act, we went through the process of uh, act, you know, collecting the material and finding out that it was going to cost us $700 a ton to recycle and that it's to do it properly, um, whereas glass and bottles cost like a dollar or was, I guess at that time it was about one or two cents a pound to recycle. Um, it was like, like I said, very demoralizing. So, but I did find out that you could send the material to China and you can make one to two cents a pound. Not pay to get it taken away, but somebody would pay you one to two cents a pound. And so, but nobody knew what was happening to it. <clears throat> so we, I, that's when I actually start working with Silicon Valley Toxics. And one, to find out what was happening to the material. And two, I realized that what I was doing was pretty futile, that nothing was ever going to be recycled unless it was designed differently. And the manufacturers had to design it. So while I was standing on the curbside looking at stuff that was seven or ten years old, or even five years old, it, unless somebody was thinking now about what they're designing, and five or ten years from now, when it's ready to be recycled, it can be recycled and uh, materials can be recovered. It just doesn't make any sense. We're trying to recycle trash. Um, and so uh, what happens is, of course, it was labor intensive, and it, goes to, it was going over to China. We worked with a group called the Basel Action Network, and they actually um, uh, took the cameras over and found out what was happening. Um, and of course, a whole uh, farming villages actually were being um, decimated by, and turned into recycling centers, recycling communities, and this is one of the photos. And you can see here that this woman is actually doing the same thing that the youth would have had to do, is basically with a hammer knocking the, um, this copper yoke off of the um, cathode ray tube here. And of course, it's, they're getting paid pennies on the hour compared to trying to pay a youth or anybody a, a living wage to do this. So again, it's a labor-intensive um, process. And these are wires, of course, that have um, their cables and they're burned. Um, in order to recover the copper in it, and they have polyvinyl um, chloride as the coating, or the plastic coating. And of course, if you want to take, um, the, if you want to recover the precious metals, um, what is being done is you take the, um, the integrated circuit board, which has gold and silver and um, 
you know, some and copper on it, and you dump it into an acid bath of hydrochloric acid and nitric acid, and um, then it dissolves the, the fiberglass, and you have nice gold nuggets or little ones at the bottom, and you take the acid bath and you dump it in the river, and this is what happens to the river. And then the other, of course, um, realization was that these were computers that were coming from um, school districts, from institutions here in the U.S. And so, again, as we look at trying to get really creative tools to people, we want to think about what they're doing with it afterwards. Um, well, I'm, I'm depressed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you to be depressed. That's okay. <laughs> We're going to prompt, because be prompted into action. We are going to be prompted into action. And I, that's why I started off by saying this industry changes really fast. And that's mm -hmm. why I'm in it. Because I've seen so much change over the last 10 years that I've been doing this. And there's a lot that's innovative and there's a lot of potential for change. Oops. So I'll, I'll really rush through the depressing pictures then. <laughs> of course, it happens. This is the same thing is happening in Nigeria and in India. And this is a picture of when I actually went to Taiwan. And um, I went on. This is about a, a river. It's called the Aran River. And it's about 70 miles long. And um, it's so polluted with, a, with uh, electronic waste that uh, you really it stings your nose. And if you put a fish in it, it dies within a couple hours. And you could see the, the river bank. It's actually... Um, about eight foot high, and it looks like it's part of the rock formation, like a shell or something, yeah. but it's actually circuit boards stacked that oh. high. So just a real quick pop quiz. This isn't to depress you either. <laughs> you took me so seriously. <laughs> but um, what does the uh, Haiti, Afghanistan, and the U.S. have in common? The sea. <laughs> The popular vacation spot, uh, great human rights, or do we legally export hazardous waste? And we, it, we all legally export hazardous waste because the U.S. actually um, is not a signer of the Basel Treaty, which means that uh, all the other developing countries do not export their hazardous waste supposedly to, um, I'm sorry, all the developed countries don't export it to developing countries, ex with the exception of the U.S. And so that's one thing that we're working on is actually to get that, that law changed. Mm -hmm. And these are all the other countries that actually, of course, have signed it. Thank you for the $1,000. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, we have one of the things that we've done is, we, of course, we started what we call the Computer Take Back Campaign. And it is to try to get manufacturers to take back the computers and to recycle mm -hmm. them responsibly with the hope that if they're actually taking the financial um, uh, responsibility and the physical possession, not, but mostly the financial responsibility, then there'll be, there'll be some type of incentive to uh, design them differently. And for the most part, that's been very successful. Of course, the other place to dump it is prisons. And since you guys really don't want to get depressed, I won't talk too much about the prisons either. But again, it's a source of cheap labor. And these are things that we just need to think about. And I don't want to, again, I, I think that we don't want to look at this as something that's not solvable because it is very solvable and it's solvable within our lifetime. But we don't have to design things so that they're actually going to, uh, the only way that they could be sustainable is that if, it, if it's at somebody else's expense. Um, so the Computer Take Back campaign has actually um, successfully got almost a half of, uh, of the states in the U.S. to pass some type of electronic recycling legislation. And now I'll get to the point where we can talk about what you guys can do. So <laughs> one of the important things that you do is as um, grant makers, um, and you have a lot of influence on purchasing. And one of the things that the Computer Take Back campaign does and SBTC does is to try to get large institutional purchasers to influence the market by purchasing it's a green computer. And there's really not a good definition yet of what a green computer is. But it's computers with, you know, reduced numbers of toxins and that are easily recyclable or more easily recyclable and that are being designed such and that don't use prison labor and that don't use um, uh, our export. So there is a standard. It's called the EP. That's been um, it's an electronic product environmental assessment tool that's been designed by EPA and you can access that on our website or you can go to the Computer Take or Electronic Take Back Campaigns website and uh, find it there. But basically, it's asking the manufacturer to um, 
to, uh, you know, purchase something that is letting them know that this is important to you, I should say. But you want to go beyond you, what EPEAT offers, because EPEAT was basically designed by the EPA, which is a fairly low standard. You want to ask for no prison labor and that your product's being, not being exported and that the manufacturer takes it back. And really quickly, I just want to go into what the new clean tech is. And that's nanotech, and there's a, a whole variety of things that are being called clean tech now, but it's basically fuel efficient um, processes and products. And nanotech is one of the foundations of it. And you can do a lot, it's basically building things kind of at the molecular or at the atomic level. And you could do a lot of really innovative things. You could make, um, you can see on the right hand side there's solar panels that are about three inches thick, but you can also make them now if you're using nanotech, or you can make it a nano-based ink that's photovoltaic that you can um, spread onto a, uh, uh, some type of substrate and all of a sudden you can put it anywhere. You could have it any, on any building um, without a really labor-intensive process to apply it. And then it's cheap to make, and that's a picture of it. The other thing is, of course, that I talked at the beginning about the different types of um, uh, cathode ray tubes of the visual display, and you saw the woman hammering them apart. Well, this, then we're looking at new iterations of it, of course. Now we're looking at the flat panels, and now they're starting to put um, actual visual, visual displays on plastic. And so, again, you, you want to ask the questions, how is this being designed, and is it recyclable, and is it hurting people in the process of um, its manufacturing and its end-of-life management? And nanotech, of course, is being used in a variety of different projects. But the major issue here is that there's really no regulations, just like back in 1982 when there was a, uh, the, the chemical spills that happened in the 29 Superfund sites. And so we don't want to hit the repeat button. Um, there's no life cycle assessment. There's no health studies. There's no right to know. There's no chemical laws um, that apply federally. Um, there's no air monitoring that can actually detect the really small particles, et cetera. And these, of course, are all the nano companies that are located in the Bay Area. There's over 100 of them right now. So what can you do? One, you can um, ask the manufacturer to take back your computers whenever you buy one, or you can go to our website and you can um, send a message um, to the manufacturers to take it back. And this has really resonated. Hewlett Packard, Dell, um, Sony are all starting to take their computers back. It's voluntary. It happens in Europe. Uh, you know, by law, they have to take it back, so it's a double standard, but um, uh, it's a good way to start, and we're making really great progress there. The other things you can do is when you want to get your computer recycled, you can make sure that you use one of these recyclers, or it's a recycler that signed what we call the, the pledge um, of stewardship, so they're not exporting and they're not using prison labor, um, and you can use the green purchasing guidelines. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sheila, that was, despite my comment, my <laughs> one-word comment of, wow, that was depressing, it, I think it's really that it was sobering to mm -hmm. remind us that not only do we have lots of benefits, countless benefits from having access to the net, having these ready, p increasingly more portable and smaller electronic tools to improve our lives in many ways, that there's, there are other impacts. So thank you for reminding us as well as providing us um, some very easy suggestions to start becoming much more sustainable. Um, I want to open it up. We have a few minutes for some questions, two or three questions. Um, wait for the mic, and when you get the mic, please hold the mic close to, thank you, So, because we are recording this, and um, introduce yourself and your your affiliation. Sure. Hi, Tony Hansen with NVIDIA Foundation. I um, I've seen a, a really wonderful video of HP's recycling organization, and even when they take in systems from other companies, they break down every single thing. I mean, they have invested millions of dollars into their recycling program. How, how do the other organizations like Zach Enterprises and Green Citizen, how do you really know what happens to it when you, when you give it to them? It just still seems very questionable to me. It sounds like they're keeping it here in the States. And how are they reusing all of those things? Well, right now, again, there's no standards. Um, there's no federal laws or regulations um, for recycling electronics. 
And so they can take it, and um, they signed a pledge with us saying that they're not going to export it, but we don't really know. Um, we have been successful at working with like HP and with Dell, and Dell at the initially was a really very reticent about it. They had no policy at all around them, any kind of environmental policy at all. But we um, kind of convinced them that maybe they should, and uh, they actually, uh, after we um, kind of did several different types of actions with them, they um, instituted a recycling program, and that's they put it in the prisons, and um, then we let them know that that wasn't really acceptable. And what we did was we compared them with HP. Uh, this HP at the time did actually have a pretty decent, and uh, this was like five or six years ago, state-of-the-art recycling facility in Roseville. And um, we compared their activities in the prison with what happened, what was going on with HP, and it actually got really good news coverage. And that kind of competition really changed, the, uh, uh, sent Dell on a different direction. Mm -hmm. So that's really important. Um, in terms of their image and everything's green now. So, uh, but it's really hard. Even now, Dell won't tell us who their suppliers are and whether or not it's going overseas or not. So. Where's Ted Russell? Um, is the where's the mic? Oh. Actually, great. Thank you, Sheila. Thanks, Sheila. Mm -hmm. As television broadcast to go digital in 2009 with the mandate, are there widespread plans for recycling of all those old analog TV sets? Thank you for asking that. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is no. I didn't go into TVs because I didn't know if you guys were really uh, more uh, funding more of education type of activities, but it sounds like you're really funding a diff lot of variety and you're engaged in a lot of different types of um, art and Television, of course, is a premier, and no, they have not at all planned for it. No one wants to really take ownership to it at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be a tremendous wave of televisions that are going to be um, discarded, and they'll probably end up overseas, so, which isn't a, ha a good thing either. But you can contact your, uh, if you buy a new one, you should contact the, um, the manufacturer and let them know that they should recycle it responsibly. Um, I have a question over here, Cora, if mm -hmm. you hold on a minute, Cora, till you get the mic. Um, while the mic's being passed to Cora Miracatani, um, what I would like to do is a little reminder, please turn your cell phones off. Um, I know I asked early, but there are some folks that have come in later and may not have heard. Um, your cell phones, your electronic devices are interfering with the webcast. So if I, I would really ask you to please double check or if you haven't heard this, to please turn it off. Thank you. Sheila, my name is Corey Americatana. I'm with Center for Cultural Innovation. And I'm, I'm wondering from your perspective, this is such a pervasive and unregulated issue. Mm -hmm. What do you feel the major leverage points are to, to promote change in the system? I mean, is it strictly political advocacy? Is it in the consumer marketplace? Or is it in, you know, can philanthropy, pay, philanthropy pay, play a role? I'm just wondering what you think Great question. our best shot is at, at getting this to tip in a different direction. Yeah, and I think it's all three. I think it's a consumer marketplace that um, over maybe about five years ago, um, when we started working, for example, on the green guidelines with um, EPA, the industry didn't want to necessarily, they didn't take it that seriously in a lot of ways because they didn't feel like there's a market for it. But once companies like Kaiser Permanente say they want to purchase green computers, which they have done, or when we, for example, had a campaign with the University of California, and all of a sudden, and they uh, passed green purchasing guidelines too, it makes a lot of difference. Those are big clients. And so when large institutions that you're either supporting or that you work with actually, or you even, as Northern California grant makers, all of you got together and purchased green computers or made that kind of um, a request, it makes a lot of difference. The other thing is, of course, there needs to be a level playing field that companies don't want to be out front and there's no benefit to making a green computer if nobody's going to buy it or if there's no reward in the marketplace for it. But if everybody has to do it, then... Um, the, then, of course, um, it has a real serious, significant paradigm shift. And that's what's happened in Europe as well. So. Um, it's time to close this session for now. Thank you so much, Sheila. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Thank you.